everybody, Philippa here and welcome to my talk on Troilus and Cressida. By the time Shakespeare came to write this play in 1601-2, he'd come off an enormously successful decade of playwriting where he was the leader of the preeminent theatre company in England, lauded by the Queen and to all of the commoners alike. So he became increasingly experimental and ambitious. He wanted his audiences to know that he was not just a playwright, but he was also a scholar. And so he based the play on one of the most famous historical wars, the Trojan War. He also became very ambitious and experimental in his style of writing. So this play uh, has four different genres doing battle with each other, comedy, history, romance and tragedy and no one strain is allowed to predominate. Now in this kind of writing, this, this kind of play is labelled by many scholars and audience members a problem play like say The Merchant of Venice or Measure for Measure because it has a complex score because the complexity does not easily allow the play to fit into a certain genre. We know that in Shakespeare's tragedies there's always a comic strain that accentuates the tragic note and vice versa, but with problem plays the strains are infinitely more complex and unable to be resolved. And what's beautiful about this play in the way it uses these strains, and I think of the musical metaphor that was given us by Harley Granville Barker, who talked about a Shakespeare play being like an orchestral score awaiting performance. What's beautiful about this score is that Shakespeare thereby is able to challenge the value of ideals of both warfare and love by the practicalities of making one's way through this life in which circumstance often gets in the way of what we may hold dear just as when we're trying to perform a play different strains might get in the way of the strain that we most want to hear. So he actually makes the form of the writing mirror the ideals and values that he was trying to challenge with this play. So the play is based, as I mentioned before, on the Trojan War, which took place in about 1100 BC in what was then called Asia Minor and is now called Turkey. Homer had taken up this war in his Iliad and Odyssey, and in the Iliad, for example, he has Prince Paris fall in love with Helen from the opposite camp. Uh, Helen is cast a spell over by Aphrodite so that she is also in love with Paris. They both take off to Troy and thereby ignite the Trojan War. This story would resound through the centuries. It was picked up again by Chaucer in Troilus and Crusade. In his long epic poem, Chaucer had Troilus die and look down from the heavens, but Shakespeare very specifically does not have either Troilus or Cressida die. He has them live on way beyond the use of their values, which I think is really intriguing. In this play, we will see King Priam talking with his sons Paris, Hector and Troilus about the Trojan War. It's been going on seven years, there's been so much bloodshed and he says is it worth it for the capture of this one woman, Helen, to lose so much blood? Hector says no. Troilus, ever the idealist, says yes. Value is most important. Valour is most important. Our ideals are most important. Ironically, Hector will end up fighting in the war and lose his life. So that's one of the ironies that will come to pass. But 
When we meet Troilus, he tells us that despite the importance of the Trojan War, the war in his own breast is far more important. The battle he has had to come to terms with the enormity of his love for Cressida. The two of them get married and then Cressida's father, who is a priest, goes to the Greek camp and he orders that a Trojan soldier captive by the Greeks has to be returned and he will, in return for that, bring Cressida over to the Greek camp. Troilus and Cressida are devastated. Cressida has to go. She swears to Troilus that her love for him will be eternal. He then sneaks out of the Trojan camp just to catch a glimpse of Cressida. And he finds to his horror that she's gotten together with a Greek soldier, Diomedes. He comes back to the Trojan camp, dives into the war, he's lost his ideals, and as I mentioned, he survives where his brother does not. So there's the play in a nutshell. You'll notice when you first meet Troilus that his language is very elevated. It's astonishingly similar to the language of the early Romeo in Romeo and Juliet, so much so that Heming and Condal, the compositors who put Shakespeare's works together after his death, actually slotted this play in after Romeo and Juliet, thinking that they were so similar in tone that they had to be written back to back. This play is actually written almost a decade after Romeo and Juliet, but Shakespeare continues to be fascinated by the notion of how ideals play out with the exigencies of human life, how we manage those ideals while dealing with the ephemeral nature of being human and having circumstance get in the way of ideals. So Troilus's early language is hugely lofty and it's quite a relief when in Act 3 he actually meets with Cressida, suddenly, thank God, goes from poetry to prose and he says simply, you have bereft me of all words, lady, and it's so beautiful and simple. But in Shakespeare's hands, the lovers are never left long without being challenged by other characters in the play, particularly Thersites, who is Cressida's cheerful, bawdy pimp, who's always making fun of the ideals of love and war. For instance, he says, lechery, lechery, still wars and lechery, nothing else holds fashion. Society's comments, biting, witty, gritty, punctuate the play and puncture characters' ideals about themselves, their value and allegiances. There's another character I want to briefly mention, Ulysses, the commander of the Greeks. Ulysses has two famous passages, one of them about degree, where he says, take but degree away and look what discord follows. Here's that musical motif again, the idea of the instruments in an orchestra, not knowing how to play in tune without a commander. And we can imagine the English people as they nervously awaited Queen Elizabeth I's imminent death, knowing she would die without an heir and not knowing what would happen to their country and way of living and being. Ulysses has another passage where he says that a strange fellow has written him and said that a man, no matter what he have, has and what he believes he represents, if that essence is not reflected back to him, then it's as if he never had it. So in other words, worth is not intrinsic. It is only socially ascribed. And in the marketplace of valuation, anything is fair game. So this idea of worth being extrinsic 
and not being internal is so fascinating when we place this play together with, say, Hamlet, who keeps arguing for his internal core. And we see in this play a much more disingenuous view of human nature and the value that we human beings have to ourselves and to each other. I think this play speaks deeply to the cynicism of our current moment. It's bitter, ironic and satiric tone. It's cynical depictions of love, sexuality, war, allegiance. It's abundance of animal imagery. It's questioning of the very premise of status and grounds for action are also relevant today in a world of alternative facts that can radically shift the ground for belief and action that we thought we stood on. We humans, Shakespeare suggests, only make and adhere to forms of degree. So standards of degree are going to be made by those in power and benefit the powerful, but we can unmake them in this one spin each of us has around the earth and we don't have to repeat all the spins and the sins that have gone before. We can believe in people's value, reflect that back to each other and we will live with more belief in our capacity to act, to love, to value and to be different. Thank you everybody and see you next week.